Yeah. Hello, everyone. I don't have slides, um, but I have a few notes. So I'm not, I'm from Red Hat. I work in the consulting branch. I'm an uh, architect, so architect. When you have that in your job title, you know you're supposed to be vaguely technical, but you don't actually have to know anything. So it's pretty good um, uh, and comfortable. Um, so I work with Red Hat Consulting, which means I work with big Red Hat cu customer, helping them uh, work with our products or other products or, or anything really. So I don't have really a position where I'm, I have to sell anything or, or proclaim that we're the best in the world. Uh, it's good if people keep buying Red Hat stuff because they pay my salary, obviously. But wha what I want to share is my experience. So I work mostly in the field on implementations. I'm not necessarily, I don't have necessarily the technical depths of someone who is in engineering. Um, but I do have to make that stuff work. So it gives me also this position where I know what big enterprise customers are doing with that. Not just web startups, not just the cool stuff, but maybe um, uh, companies that move slower, but are, are interesting in the sense that if you see them adopt a new technology, it tends to be a sign that something is happening. Um, I have no idea how long I have and if there's a clock or anything, so you'll tell me. Anyway, I don't intend to be long, but what I want to share, I say I'm going to do a short history of containers at Red Hat. This is from my point of view, so that's just a little guy seeing what's happening around him. I think it's interesting because um, you learn a few things about some Red Hat products, obviously, but also I'm pretty sure from what I'm seeing on the market that the way Red Hat adopted uh, technologies like Docker and, and Kubernetes is not actually far from uh, what's happening in other companies, whether they're in the IT business or, or the enterprises and and I think it's, it's interesting and it kind of shows the, the value of some of these technologies and projects. So it's not a marketing pitch. It, I'm trying to do the opposite of a marketing pitch um, and share my, my little experience. So the, the container thing first, because there's always discussion about containers. So containers, uh, it's not new. It's been here forever. So why people are talking about Docker now? Why containers now? We tend to have the discussion, can be very technical, like, oh, this little thing was running 10 years ago, so why are people saying it's new? And we talked about Solaris. Uh, if you talk to Solaris people, uh, especially X and guys, they say, well, we had that a long time ago, and there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, but still, obviously, there's a large uh, uh, growth of adoption. A lot of people are excited about that. So. How did it happen for us? We, we had a product called OpenShift. Um, it's a platform as a, as a service solution. Um, it was basically a product that was uh, designed for enterprise that wanted to, de to deploy a pass or build a pass in their internal uh, infrastructure. It was similar to Heroku, if you know Heroku. And the idea is that, so historically, past products or platform or project have been designed around the, the developer experience, largely developer, not just developer. But the idea is that you choose components. Most of the time, it's going to be languages, frameworks, but could be also backends, database, sometimes messaging frameworks. And then um, these are your requirements for your app. And you bring your code and your data, and then you run that stuff on a slice of a server. That's the general idea, right? So it is a lot about this user experience, saying, OK, you don't have to care about managing that stuff. You get a slice, and you take your requirement, you push your code, and that's it. Of course, in the software world, nothing is ever, that's it. But that's the idea. And of course, you get this slice of a system. So, And this slice for OpenShift, but other platforms as a service projects, was a container, kind of a container. Um, so at the time they built it, there wasn't really uh, anything like Docker, of course. And even LXA wasn't <coughs> really something that was ready for that. Um, so they implemented it based on several technologies that were available in the Linux world. And again, it wasn't unique. Other people work with that. And it's also a way of saying, well, what is it exactly a container? What, what, 
does it do? Because it's not one piece of technology, right? It's several things, several different things. And first, it's the containment from a resource point of view. Because you give a slice, you want different users, different projects to have only part of this environment, not everything. So you, you, you contain um, a project or, a, or an application to an amount of memory, an amount of CPU time, and so on. And this was achieved with C groups, which is still uh, what I think everybody uses in the, in the Linux world for that. And then you need a level of, um, let's say, separation of resources, because you're in the same environment, so things like networking, the application want to um, have a, um, possibly an IP address, let's say. Um, you want to give the illusion to the application that it is running on a server, right? So that was partly achieved with namespaces because when OpenShift started, it was running on RHEL 6, which is kind of a older kernel now. Um, so only part of the namespacing was implemented. I think that even, at least in the Red Hat world for RHEL, uh, uh, user namespace is kind of a new feature. It's, it's kind of recent. So namespaces is just about saying, let's say a user namespace is a good example. Uh, if I, in my container I'm root, it doesn't mean I'm also root in other containers or on the host. It's um, uh, just about hiding global resources. And it could be also man points, it could be the host name, it could be process IDs and so on. So that's the second thing about containers that was in OpenShift and they had to solve. And that was using uh, uh, kernel features, namespacing. And then there's the security aspect of it. Well, you don't want a process in a container to be able to um, take over uh, the host and you don't want them to get privileges in other containers and so on. And for OpenShift, that was achieved with, with SL Linux. This is actually what I find the most complex issue, security. Even in the Docker world nowadays, there's a lot of, uh, s let's say, small corner cases and things like multi-tenancy is still a challenge. But anyway, they, these are the three things that made OpenShift a container-based solution, right? Using cgroups for resources, using namespaces for let's say, resource hiding, aliasing, and then using SL Linux for, for security and containment. And the idea was OpenShift was a product that was maturing and evolving and kind of waiting for LXA to LXC, which was seen as the future standard container solution in Linux, to get mature enough that they could drop their, uh, uh, the stuff they had developed themselves and just use uh, LXC. But on the road to LXC, Docker was open sourced. And I mean, Docker was open sourced, I think, two years ago, just uh, over two years ago. It was in July, I think. So it's very recent from a certain point of view. But if you look at the landscape nowadays, Docker is everywhere, right? And the adoption was very, very quick, at least the interest. So I, I saw that at least in engineering like Linux teams, like the RHEL team, and the OpenShift team, obviously, they were interested in containers. There was an interest and in people testing it very quickly. And even at customers, I saw interest for Docker. People were starting to ask, well, what is it exactly? So the kind of curiosity and first, um, first adoption, in the sense, testing in, having a look at it, was very, very fast. And then it really took off as a project where people were contributing and so on. Um, and it was interesting because from an OpenShift point of view, which was the project that was mainly interested in containers at Red Hat, it did cover some, of some similar stuff. It was similar to what they had done, but with a different approach. Um, one of the things was the layered image format. Right? I think that there's a lot of discussion about is it good, should it be everywhere, and and the implementation, should it be done with this technology or that? But when it appeared, it was a brilliant idea, I think, because that's where suddenly your containers can be based on something you can move around, right? You can build this image, you can take it and move it everywhere. I mean, for me, it was very novel in the sense that containers were some kind of runtime thing. It was where you run your stuff. But suddenly, with the layered image format, 
First, you have something that is the object you're going to run with the, the kind of package of everything. But also, you have this idea of a workflow, which was also an innovation from, from Docker, I think, that you have these images you can build on top of them. So it's kind of the same abstraction we had in OpenShift saying, oh, this is a cartridge, uh, um, uh, PostgreSQL uh, cartridge, this is a, a PHP cartridge, whatever, a component, but with a clearer um, implementation in the sense that all of that is an image, is a layer, you can build on top of it, ship the, the totality of it. And in that sense, they had a strong opinion about what the workflow was going to be. So it wasn't just saying, oh, these are containers, it's a good uh, runtime thing to slice a, a server into multiple environments. And it's also good to manage resources. And then you can give a small part of an environment to developers, and they're going to use uh, libraries and stuff. It's actually, you're going to do exactly that. And you'll have these images that you'll take and build on top of and redistribute, potentially. And this is going to be your workflow. The, it was very opinionated. I think part of uh, the success was the fact that it gave you an idea to, of how you would do stuff. Uh, even if not everyone agreed and you, you could invent an alternative workflow and you could say, oh, that's not the best idea, but you had one to start. And that made it very different, I think. Even if from a technological point of view, there wasn't necessarily that much, right? I internally, I remember talking to um, old school Linus Fall saying, but this is not new, right? That, that's why we're here all the time. This is not new. Um, not everything has to be new, right? And, and, and certainly, the technology doesn't have to be all new. The workflow, the API, the user experience, these are also critical aspects of ad, uh, that, that make that a technology is adopted. So people started working on it, at read that like almost everywhere, so that it would run on, on rail, of course. And then the OpenShift team decided to switch to Docker as the basis for their, for, their, for their next generation, which means they could get rid of tons of stuff they had developed themselves, including this kind of container management stuff, because then you had Docker, and you just use that. And then their, um, their own format for doing stuff like components, OK? If I want to deploy um, the uh, Python framework in my uh, application, I get it as a requirement. That was something that was packaged in a way specific to OpenShift, but then suddenly you can say, no, you get, you take an image. And we'll provide you with standard images, and then you can have images from vendors, and you can have uh, an image that is signed, and so on. So you get that kind of um, dynamic based on something that is becoming a, a de facto standard. So they adopted that, and they kept working on this next, gest next generation. And then one year later, there's Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is like, player three has entered the game, right? It's like. I'm not sure there were a lot of people who were expecting something like that to emerge. Everyone was working on orchestration, especially orchestration of containers across multiple hosts and the issues you have about, uh, around it. And there was one for our OpenShift 3, of course. But similar to Docker, but quicker in a way because, I mean, it happened faster because Kubernetes gained adoption a lot faster than even Docker, which was already something that was qu very quickly moving. Um, they decided to switch to Kubernetes to manage uh, uh, and, uh, and, and schedule these containers. And as you said, there are other projects that adopted that. And I think it's quite interesting to see uh, how it was adopted. There were other options. People were working on their own stuff. If, if you're a software engineer or if you worked on software engineering development, you know that it's not easy to say, oh, the stuff we've been working on for six months, actually, we're just going to kill it because there's something better out there. It is actually difficult to, to do. So it means that it was compelling. Um, and I think that possibly currently, my personal opinion is that Kubernetes is really the, the most interesting part of the ecosystem. And, and, and uh, the idea that now we reach a stage where, oh, OpenShift is based on Kubernetes and Docker. Mm -hmm. Um, you have other platform that could be uh, based on Kubernetes and Docker. You can run Kubernetes on GCE. You can just run Kubernetes on RHEL um, mm. or, or other systems, of course. means that you have some kind of de facto standard of what a containerized application 
could look like. It doesn't cover everything, of course, and doesn't solve everything. And there's going to be other components around it. But th this is an interesting um, thing for me. So that's the situation that, that just our experience for me, I wanted to share that because that's the fact that we adopted that so quickly while we had solutions internally and, and, and engineers were proud of their solutions. Um, and they, these teams decided to adopt that. It wasn't like management come in and say, no, from now on you use that. It's something that shows the, the kind of traction is not just people talking or, or just hype, but also a practical solution to the uh, problem they were facing as engineers. And that was it. But just quickly now, it, what is going to be interesting for me is to see what happens with networking and storage. I mean, um, if you have uh, uh, persistent volumes, for instance, yeah, you can do it quickly on the host. But how are you going to provide that as a platform? There are solutions, but is it something that is going to become um, more standardized and commoditized, or is it going to be kind of value-add from the different platforms? Also, the networking layer is interesting for me also, because I think a lot of the solutions are, are quite complex. In OpenShift, it's using OpenSV switch, for instance. Uh, it's a whole new component. Um, it's kind of a almost full feature platform, but why it was adopted and why it could be adopted quickly was also because it simplified things, right? Uh, Docker, where it is adopted, where I'm seeing it adopted, tends to be a way to uh, have less layer, make things simpler, or at least that's what people want it to be. And as the ecosystem grow, are we going to see things grow more complex and more features being added? And are we going to go back to something that has seven layers? Or are we going to keep this model that is very slim and, and quickly moving? And that's it for me. Thanks very much.